I want to talk about incomplete caries removal. Uh, I want to bring you a sort of state of the science um, update on incomplete caries removal. And I want to start by showing this radiograph, and please ignore the calculus hanging off of every tooth. And let's talk about tooth number 30. And if you saw this um, radiograph associated with a patient sitting in your chair, I ask you what might you start anticipating you might have to do? A pulp cap, a pulpotomy, perhaps endodontic treatment, other referral, or doing it yourself? But if the patient has a deep lesion such as that one, one half the dentin thickness or greater, but no signs of irreversible pulpitis, and that means it's positive to a cold test, it's negative to percussion, there's no spontaneous pain reported by the patient, and no periapical lesion evident in any radiograph that you have, then the science, the evidence suggests that you ought to consider incomplete caries removal. That is, deliberately leave caries in the preparation if it's close to the pulp and place a restoration over it. Horrors, horrors. My operative dentistry instructor is spinning right now, and there he is. And <laughs> there I am, the left-handed dentist, desperately trying to remove the caries from the patient because if I didn't, I would flunk. I would, and if this was a state board examination, I would have to take that over again. But the evidence says you'll be saving pulps and teeth. And I repeat, the evidence says that. So here's the digression. <clears throat> what is evidence? Some people think it's the black box. My purpose for this digression is to sort of crack the lid on the black box and talk about what evidence is and also give you the evidence for incomplete caries removal. So evidence is simply information from the dental knowledge base. Fine, what's the dental knowledge base? Well, it's the sum total of what the profession knows. And what's that? Well, the receptacle for what the profession knows is called the dental literature. It's the, what you've heard about all your life, that mystical dental literature that we're all up about. So how is evidence different from information in the dental literature? Well, evidence is actually information that's been packaged and focused. So evidence is a synthesis, a synthesis of all available information that addresses a specific clinical question or a specific clinical issue. I use the word synthesis, and I almost pronounced it correctly three times. How is a synthesis, what is a synthesis, and how does it work? It, as I said, combines all the information that answers the same question or describes the same clinical issue. And you complete a synthesis by searching the literature extremely thoroughly, not just a, a slapdash search. You have to find all of the information that is relevant. You include all the information you find that meets your criteria for relevancy. In other words, it addresses the question you want to have answered. And it meets your criteria for risk of bias. Now, risk of bias is the term we're using now for study quality. Because the quality of study is determined by how valid the answer uh, could be from the study, what detracts from the uh, validity of a study is bias. So the more bias a study could possibly uh, uh, incorporate, the less um, valid the answer might be, and therefore the risk of bias is higher. So all the information you decide you're going to put into your synthesis has to be combined somehow. And if possible, you combine it statistically. If not, you combine it in, uh, with a qualitative analysis. Either is acceptable, but you have to make an attempt to incorporate all the information you found in the literature into one answer to your question. And then you report this evidence in a systematic review. Now, a systematic review is now the preferred vehicle method for getting evidence to the practicing profession. So a systematic review is simply a report of an evidence synthesis. It's a, it describes the clinical question you're trying to address. It gives the, and describes the criteria that you use for including the studies. It describes how the search was done and how the studies were actually selected. It gives the results of each of the included studies, including the uh, level of risk of bias for each study, so you know how good the evidence is. And all the evidence isn't necessarily good. And then it describes how the synthesis was done and what the results of the synthesis were. It's really just a study of studies. And it's the least biased method that science has come up with so far for assembling the evidence to answer any given clinical question. Now, most of you saw a pyramid like this when you were somewhere in your dental education. It was probably called the pyramid of study quality or the pyramid of the uh, hierarchy of, um, of research designs. And what's different about it now from when you saw it 
unless you graduated very recently, is that the top spot is now occupied by systematic reviews rather than uh, randomized controlled trials. Because the randomized controlled trial was the, the uh, par excellence of uh, study quality. But the trouble is it's only one study. And if you do one thing wrong, you might get the wrong answer. And we see that all the time with conflicting randomized controlled trials answering the question, same question differently. But if you collect all of the evidence through systematic reviews, then you have the best chance of getting the right answer. So we're talking about systematic reviews as the best kind of evidence. Now, it behooves me to talk about what is not evidence very briefly. And unfortunately, I'm going to tell you something, and I don't mean to demean you, but your experience is not good evidence. It's what you believe, but it's not necessarily good evidence. And when we talk about evidence now, we're talking about answering the clinical question about what's the outcome of a certain kind of treatment? What works better? That kind of question. It used to be it was the only evidence available before we had a dental literature. Unfortunately, it's open to a variety of cognitive biases. And these are what render it very suspect in terms of being evidence for the uh, effectiveness of various treatments. Here's a couple examples of why your experience may not be good evidence. One is called the availability heuristic, and it simply says that it's easier to recall consequential events than it is inconsequential events. As an example, say you put a sealant on your colleague's daughter's tooth, and three years later, later it blows up. You're going to remember that sealant. You're going to remember that sealant a lot better than the 2,000 you put on that didn't blow up. And when somebody comes to you and says, what do you think about sealant stock? You might say, well, you know, they don't always work very well. And because you, you're doing that because you remember that one sealant. But in fact, they work extremely well. But what comes to mind when you think of sealants? That one molar. A second cognitive bias that we all have, because we're all human, is confirmation bias. And this is in the, the, the tendency we all have to interpret events in the light of our own fixed beliefs. An example I offer is some dentists don't think that composites last very long. So if you are one of those dentists and you see a composite that has sort of a, a sketchy margin and it's three or four years old, you're probably going to say, well, you know, that, that, that composite is failing. I'm going to have to replace it. And you chalk it up to yet another composite that failed at year three or year four. Whereas another dentist who thinks composites are the best kind of restoration possible will look at the margin and say, well, you know, it's getting a little bit deteriorated, but it's still good, it's still sealed. We'll let it go. It's fine. So you interpret various events in the light of what you already believe. These two reasons, among a host of other cognitive biases, are the reason why your individual experience is not good. It, the risk of bias is high for your individual experience in terms of telling you what is the best treatment. So your experience is extremely valuable. It's crucial to treatment selection and delivery but it's not necessarily the best evidence to know which treatments work the best in terms of their expected outcomes. But matching a treatment to a patient, that's your bailiwick, but you have to know how the treatments work using evidence, not just your experience. That's the end of the digression. Let's talk about incomplete caries removal and the evidence for it. This is a procedure that's known by a lot of different terms. The most common are indirect pulp treatment, indirect pulp cap, and partial caries removal. And in fact, there's two different ways to do it. The first way is, the first method is a, one, called one step or single entry, where you uh, do a cavity preparation with, in a, 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 a tooth that has deep carious lesion, and you leave the carious dentin where you think if you removed it, you would expose the pulp or hit a pulp horn. You simply leave it there. You don't worry about how much you're leaving, you just leave it wherever you think there's risk of, of exposing the pulp. You then put a liner in if you care to, and you put a permanent restoration on, and that's the end of the procedure. And you don't worry about going back in or doing anything. That's the end of the procedure. The second method, and this has been around for, I was taught this in dental school, and that was before the light bulb was invented, I think, um, is called stepwise, also called uh, indirect pulp cap. You do the same thing you do in method one, but you put a temporary restoration, or at least a restoration that's intended to be temporary, in the tooth and you come back between one month and 12 months later, remove the carious dentin that you left in and you hope that there is a, a bridge of a dentinal, a secondary dentin laid down by the pulp that will keep you from exposing the pulp during that excavation of the original carious dentin. Then you put a liner in and then you restore the tooth with a permanent restoration.
So these are two different ways of accomplishing the same thing. One leaves the carries in permanently, one leaves it in for a, a matter of months. So how well do these work? Well, how would we measure how well they work? There's two measures that are available to us, and we'll use both of those. The first is uh, pulp exposure, and the second is the tooth survival rate after the procedure. So the pulp exposure will be the immediate outcome. You don't want a pulp exposure, but sometimes you get them. You would like to minimize the number of pulp exposures, so that's the immediate outcome. And then the tooth survival rate would be the longer term outcome, but in this case, because the literature is limited in terms of longer uh, survival rates, we have to talk about a short term survival rate, which would be an intermediate outcome. The next two years, say, and that's about as far as the literature goes, two to three years. So fortunate for us, there was a systematic review that was published last year on this topic. And this systematic review included studies that either tested method one versus complete caries removal or method two versus complete caries removal. So we get to look at all three of these caries removal uh, results from all three of these caries removal methods. So for the one step, no reentry caries removal method, there were six studies that had this as one of the two study arms, 376 teeth. The pulp exposure rate across these six studies was 1%. And the annual failure rate was also 1%. But most of these studies only went between one and two years. So it's a short annual failure rate estimation. The stepwise method with the reentry, there were four studies also 376 teeth, and that's just a fluke. The two study sets are not linked. It just happened to be the same number. 10% failure rate and a 6% annual failure rate. a uh, 10% exposure rate, excuse me, and a 6% annual failure rate. And I should tell you that the majority of the exposures in this group occurred at re-entry, not original entry. And then finally, there was complete caries removal. This was the control arm for both of the sets of studies I just mentioned. So there were 10 studies. 741 teeth with a 32% pulp exposure rate and a 9% annual failure rate. So at least for the short term, the one step looks better than either of the other alternatives, both in annual failure rate and in the, uh, uh, the chances of pulp exposure. Now there is a second systematic review also published the same year, last year. This is slightly different. It has a slightly different mix of studies because this was a Cochrane review and it only accepted randomized controlled trials, whereas the first review I showed you accepted uh, trials that were not necessarily randomized as well. So in, in the, for the one-step arm, there were three studies, 92 teeth, small group of teeth, 5% exposure rate. This systematic review did not look at annual failure rates, so we only have pulp exposure rates. The second um, <clears throat> arm, the stepwise arm, uh, four studies, 324 teeth, 15% failure rate, and finally, the complete removal arm, eight studies, 669 teeth, 28% failure rate. So here we have a slightly different mix of studies, but we see the same pattern in both, both of the reviews, that the one step tends to have the lowest pulp exposure rate, followed by the stepwise, followed by the complete removal of caries with the highest exposure rate, which is what you'd expect. The one thing that may be unexpected is the fact that the, most of the um, exposures for the stepwise occurred at the re-entry, not the original entry. Now there's one more study I want to show you. It's not a systematic review. It's a study out of Brazil, and the reason it wasn't included in either systematic review was that it didn't have an, a, a complete caries removal arm. It compared the one step to the two step. 2012, it's a recent study. Fairly large study, 112 teeth in the one-step arm, no pulp exposures, 3% annual failure rate, and this study did go out a full three years. So this, this may be a more uh, reasonable time on which to look at an intermediate outcome. It is not a long-term outcome, however. And the stepwise, 101 teeth, 3% pulp exposures, again, mostly at re-entry, and a 10% annual failure rate. So here's all the evidence that is current in the literature that talks about incomplete caries removal, comparing the one step and the stepwise to the complete caries removal. And a thinking practitioner would start maybe suspecting that there is an interesting way to start doing this, and that would be leave the caries in. But we don't know anything about the long-term outcomes yet. And what we need to know is mode of failure. If the one steps do fail, do they fail because of pulpal issues like everything else that you would expect? 
or do they fail because they're, they collapse because the carries has been left in and it's inadequate support to support the uh, enamel shell? We don't know how they fail yet. There's been one systematic review on failure rate, uh, but it, it was a little bit, um, it combined the first and the, uh, the, the one step and the stepwise failures, so you can't really tell um, how the one step uh, teeth did fail. However, it did show that the majority, the vast majority of failures was because of pulpal reasons, not because of tooth fracture. So it, it, it looks like it's pretty good for one step, but the data are not completely in yet. Just a couple little additional findings. The liner of the base doesn't seem to make a difference. Most of these were calcium hydroxide, but there were some uh, resin modified glass ionomers as well. And one study used no liner, no base, and it didn't seem to make a difference. Most were restored with composite resin, uh, very few amalgam restorations. So I'm not sure you can uh, generalize from composite to amalgam because the sealing of the cavity is extremely important in these types of procedures. And so not surprisingly, the su survival is poor if you have the involvement of two or more surfaces, probably because you can't seal the uh, restoration as well. And the most surprising thing to me is that there was no apparent difference by uh, the age of the patient or by whether the tooth was a permanent or a primary tooth. Uh, these, most of these studies had, were, were done on adolescents with a few studies with some adults in it, and so there was a, a good opportunity to uh, make these comparisons, although the numbers were small, but there was no obvious difference in the rates of failure or the pulp exposure uh, by age or by type of tooth. And finally, it was quite uh, convincingly demonstrated in several of the uh, stepwise uh, studies that went in and it sampled the bacteria after the, the uh, preparation had been reopened that the bacterial load was substantially reduced over what it was when it was first entered. So there's not much concern as long as the tooth is sealed with the bacteria continuing to be active and continuing to um, demineralize dentin. So that's the presentation. Um, and here's the, here's the observation. This evidence really does contradict what almost all of you were taught in dental school and what you were evaluated on in dental school and what you were evaluated on in your state board. So how easy is it going to be to change that? Now our second speaker is going to talk about those kind of things, but the questions I want you to concentrate on for this thing is have you done this in your practice? And if you have, what's been your experience? Now I'm asking you for your experience, it's not evidence, it's experience, but you think you will try this technique if you haven't done so already. And would you choose to re-enter at a later date, as I was taught to do 40-some-odd years ago? And how would you explain this whole thing to a patient? And do you think there's sufficient evidence yet to do this, or should we wait for longer-term outcomes on the annual failure rates? Thank you.